selected by the majority of shoppers, hmm? which would be teenage girls. Dick, Dick Cheney would have spent two terms as vice president with his midriff exposed. You know, I mean, so, yeah. Imagine deciding what's for dinner by family secret ballot, you know? I've got three kids and three dogs in my family. We'd be serving Oreos and rotten meat, you know? Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. You just heard the late P.J. O'Rourke, who spoke at Acton's 23rd anniversary dinner in 2013, delivered remarks on the current state of American governance. O'Rourke recently passed away at his home in New Hampshire, February 15, 2022. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. The judge was just uh, telling me that he was, didn't mention that I'm also on NPR sometimes, unless... <laughs> just in case people have things left on the table that they could throw. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm the only Republican, the only Republican on NPR. And, and, and whenever anything Republican happens, they have to call me. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is, seriously, this is true. When uh, Dick Cheney uh, uh, shot uh, the fellow uh, in a, I was the only person that NPR knew that owned a gun. <laughs> So, and they actually called me. They called me and they said, so was it like a gun on a ship? You know, like, or, uh, and I you know, patiently explained to them, you know, the difference between a shotgun and a rifle and how these things happen. So, yeah. um, now, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm a little daunted here because I, I am no Acton scholar. Uh, however, I have, I, I have read the book that he didn't write, you know, uh, the, the History of Liberty. I, 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 it, it, that is, uh, and, and, and from that reading, I know that I'm just not a fit person to be addressing the Acton Institute's annual dinner. I, I am not moral enough, I'm not philosophical enough, and I am not, judging by my bank balance, knowledgeable enough about the free market. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm certainly not the right person to plumb the depths of Lord Acton's brilliant, subtle, and complex thinking. I mean, and the man, a man with intelligence so great that he was, and he is, the only intellectual to ever face full-on the profound conundrums of religious faith, moral philosophy, economic activity, and political action. I mean, what other man than Lord Acton, so deeply religious, so perfectly devoted to the cause of liberty, would begin his 1877 lecture on liberty with the words, liberty, next to religion, has been the motive of good deeds and the common pretext of crime. Mm -hmm. What other sage, uh, at once so strong in his belief in God's blessings, and so committed to human freedom that he could state that paradox flat out. He said, liberty is so holy a thing that God was forced to permit evil that liberty might exist. You know? So, all this is by way of saying that I am too stupid to be speaking to you tonight. <laughs> it's like, it's like, uh, but... In fairness to myself, uh, I am not just stupid. I am a student of stupidity. <laughs> I am a political reporter. <laughs> we live in a democracy. We live in a democracy. We live in a democracy ruled by the people. 50% of people are below average intelligence. Mathematical fact explains everything about politics. And it also illuminates Lord Acton's maxim, 
It is easier to find people to govern themselves than people fit to govern others, you know? And that's why we must continue to support democracy, even when democracy is acting up the way it has been doing lately. Um, we don't want to be ruled only by an elite. Uh, we don't want to be ruled only by the best and the brightest. That would be too much like being married to Nancy Pelosi. So, um, um, Again, I quote Lord Acton, he said, the danger is not that a particular class is unfit to govern, every class is unfit to govern. And that seems to be particularly true of the political class that is governing or failing to govern in Washington right now. Um, now, Lord Acton, uh, with his fine sense of the ambiguities of government, uh, he would have had sympathy in, for the Tea Party, uh, uh, Tea Party inspired deadlock in Congress. Uh, he said, it is bad to be oppressed by a minority, but it is worse to be oppressed by a majority, which is what we have going on right now in Washington. And yet, on the other hand, he pointed out that political deadlock is not an ideal to be pursued. He said, governing is the only way to avoid being governed. You know? And the way we're avoiding being governed at the moment is by partially shutting down the federal government, which means I can partially stop paying taxes. <laughs> or do I have that wrong? I, no. Now, it's interesting to me, the parts of government that get shut down during a partial government shutdown, they close the Grand Canyon. <laughs> How do you even do that? <laughs> I have been there. It's huge. You know? <laughs> that is a lot of yellow security do not enter tape. You know? <laughs> and where is the water in the Colorado River supposed to go? You know? <laughs> one, one, million, one million government employees are out of work, which raises the question, they were working? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Actually, a complete shutdown of government is a tempting idea at times. I have a 15-year-old daughter. Complete shutdown of adolescence? Mm, might be worth a try. Just lock her in her room, you know? I mean, she's got enough of plates of half-eaten food and open bags of snack mix and old juice bottles under the bed. She's not going to starve. Um, but we're not supposed to do this in families, and our politicians are not supposed to do this in Washington. We, we elected them to be our representatives in government. We didn't elect them to be our instruments of prolonged torture, um, though perhaps that comes with the territory. Uh, uh, Lord Acton noted in an article for the classical liberal Catholic journal, The Rambler, he noted the modern state is, 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 is a mere machine, not fitted on to society like a glove, but rather compressing it like a thumbscrew. <laughs> as, uh, as much as I object to President Obama's Affordable Care Act, and I object a lot, uh, I don't think deliberate imposition of political deadlock is the right strategy to combat it. I think the right strategy is to do a better job of explaining what's wrong with the Affordable Care Act, explaining the authoritarian nature of this legislation, uh, perhaps in Lord Acton's own words. Uh, authority, he said, has been the main actor in history and is mainly responsible for its horrors. You know? Then we must do a better job of offering alternatives to the Affordable uh, Care Act, uh, using a principle to which uh, Lord Acton adhered, uh, that a law must be responsible to those who obey, not to those who command. And after that, we must find better House and Senate candidates uh, than those who favor the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and this should not be hard. A random walk through the phone book ought to do that. Um, <laughs> And finally, we must win the 2014 congressional elections with a veto-proof majority of sensible legislators <laughs> and, um, and replace the Affordable Care Act with something that not only reflects liberty and morality, but also that actually works. You know? uh, I don't think political deadlock, however principled the reasons for it, is doing the proponents of liberty uh, any 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 uh, of liberty and morality. Uh, I don't think it's doing us any favors with the electorate. And, and, and although a temporary deal has been made, the budget and debt ceiling deadlocks will come back uh, quite soon. Uh, should Congress vote to raise the debt ceiling? 
Now, I confess, this has always seemed a slightly absurd question to me. Uh, if your living room were filled to the ceiling with sewage, would you pump the sewage or would you raise the ceiling? Uh, no, I not, I but, um, but I'm not a politician. I'm not a politician, uh, so I don't know sewage from Shinola, so to speak. I, I, I mean, I, not the way politicians do, you know. I, I, I am still trying to figure out the budget sequester. Uh, with sequester, Congress cut $85 billion out of the budget. Uh, uh, $24.7 billion was taken out of the defense budget. Uh, and, well, what were the way things are going in Egypt and Iraq, Afghanistan and, and Syria, and, and the strong backing that we're getting from the UN and our allies such as England, uh, and helpful involvement of Russia? Uh, <laughs> This seemed like just the moment to take $42.7 billion out of the defense budget. I, uh, um, I, I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't help but laugh at the whole Syrian chemical weapons, Obama, Assad, Putin show. You know, it's, it, was like, it seemed to me like it was like the world's worst Dirty Harry movie. You know? <laughs> so President Obama going, drop the gun. And Assad going, how about if I give the gun to a friend? And President Obama going said, well, well, okay, but only if the friend is somebody I don't trust and who hates my guts. <laughs> but anyway, as I was saying about the sequester, um, I, 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 I Googled the federal budget. I, I ran my finger down the budget outlays by detailed function column. It took me five minutes to cut $85 billion. International affairs. $56.3 billion. What are we doing having international affairs anyway? Um, you know, <laughs> American guys and gals aren't cute enough for us, or what? You know? <laughs> so that's $56 billion right there, okay? And community and regional development, $31.7 billion. Now, this is federal money that goes to poor places in America, and, and of course, we want to govern according to principles of Christian charity. And yet, the poorest place in America is Mississippi. The state of Mississippi's per capita gross domestic product is $33,967. Do you know what the per capita GDP of Saudi Arabia is? $24,268. We are sending taxpayer money to a place that is half again richer than Saudi Arabia. You know, I mean, next we'll be shipping sand to Riyadh, you know. So. So that's another $31.7 billion. So actually, it took me five minutes to cut $88 billion out of the federal budget. Um, I blame this on Mitt Romney um, <laughs> for not getting elected. <laughs> it, it was the dog. It was the dog on the roof, wasn't it? That's, it, 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 that's what did it. Americans love dogs. Um, Mitt Romney's got kids. You know, if Romney had strapped one of the kids to the roof of the car, Come on, we've all been tempted. <laughs> Long car trips. <laughs> Would have humanized Mitt. <laughs> but Romney, although a man of strong faith, of good morality, uh, of, of excellent political philosophy, and obviously with uh, incredible understanding of the free market, uh, he, he just didn't deserve to get elected. He ran a terrible campaign, I swear. By election day last November, voter, voters were going to the polls basically trying to decide who was the worst fool, the fellow who wanted to turn America into Greece or, or the fellow who wanted to turn America into Lehman Brothers. You know. <laughs> Now, not that I'm happy that President Obama won. Um, he raised taxes. I, I don't like that. Of course, he raised taxes only on rich people. I do like that. Uh, then I read the fine print. Uh, it turns out I'm rich. <laughs> I would have sworn I was broke. <laughs> Three kids to put through school, a house that's currently worth less than a FEMA trailer on a Colorado floodplain. <laughs> And I'm trying to make a living as a print journalist. <laughs> now, we have, um, we have two parties in this country. We have the stupid party and the silly party. Um, now, as I mentioned, I'm stupid, so I, I vote for the stupid party. I, uh, I vote Republican. I, I vote Republican because Republicans have fewer ideas. <laughs> but not few enough. <laughs> 
Homeland Security, the Iraq War, no child left behind. What if they deserve to be left behind? Mm -hmm. what, what if they deserve a smack on the behind? You know? <laughs> Nationwide testing program to determine whether kids are what? Dumb? You've got kids. Kids are dumb. <laughs> Now, the government, uh, the Democrats say, gov uh, the Democrats say the government, government can make us richer, smarter, taller, with a better health insurance policy and 10 strokes off our golf game. The Republicans say government doesn't work, and then they get elected and prove it. Uh, <laughs> Democrats say we don't know what's wrong with capitalism, but we can fix it. The Republicans say there's nothing wrong with capitalism, and we can fix that. Um, as Lord Acton put it, we contemplate our ideas in the sunlight of heaven and apply them in the darkness of earth. Now, you may think politicians don't accomplish anything because of partisan political bickering. No. We want them to bicker. Because the two most frightening words in Washington are bipartisan consensus. Bipartisan consensus. That's like when my doctor and my lawyer agree with my wife that I need help. <laughs> I mean, people say, people say, oh, 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 America is so polarized. Well, no, we're not. And we're just split on some issues. You know, I mean, half of America wants more social services to be paid for by other people, and half of America is other people. You know? <laughs> You know, frankly, half of the time, half of us can't remember which half we're in. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, personally, for me, it varies from day to day. Uh, some days I'm a Medicare Plan D prescription drug beneficiary, and some days it's April 15th. You know? um, anyway, America's not polarized. 1861, that was polarized. You know? Anyway, as I was saying, bipartisan consensus. In fact, it happens all the time uh, 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 because all politicians, Democrats and Republicans alike, want government to solve every one of the world's problems from curing cancer to getting here comes honey boo boo off cable TV. You know? <laughs> they want government to do this. I mean, government can't run a post office. A government has trouble figuring out where mail goes, you know, and mail has got our address right on the front of it. You know? <laughs> government solving all of the world's problems this is expensive, you know. And it's not just that I don't want to pay more taxes personally. It's, it's, it's the big picture that gets me. America's gross domestic product is about $14 trillion a year. America's combined federal, state, and local government spending is $5.8 trillion a year. That's 40% of GDP. Government is spending 40% of our money. Ought to be enough. I mean, if you were giving your college kid 40% of your income as an allowance, should hold him till the end of the semester, right? Yeah. <laughs> government is spending 40% of our money. Is government doing 40% of our work? Is government doing 40% of our laundry? You know, when it's TGIF, is government tending bar, making sure that four out of 10 margaritas are on the house? You know, I mean, when your spouse is feeling romantic and you're tired, you know, does government come over to your house and... Well, actually, during the Clinton administration, <laughs> that could have happened. Um, now, the president, the president thinks we can spend our way out of the recession. Uh, my wife and two daughters have been trying this at the mall. Uh, it's, it's not working. <laughs> $447 billion Jobs Act plus the $700 billion TARP program plus the $787 billion stimulus package plus the $3.8 trillion 2013 federal budget. You add that up and it equals more money than there is. There, there ain't that much money. You know, I mean, government is spending money that doesn't exist. Where will they get it? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that right now, Treasury Secretary Jack Yu, Liu, he is uh, in the visitor's room at a uh, federal prison trying to pry the secret out of Bernie Madoff. You know? <laughs> Actually, you know, there's another reason. There's another reason that government is so expensive. Um, more than 30 years ago, in his PBS television special, Free to Choose, Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman explained it. He used a simple chart, four boxes, to show that mathematically 
There are only four ways that money can be spent. Only four ways to do it. Only four ways to st- that you can spend money are is to spend your money on yourself, or you can spend your money on other people, or you can spend other people's money on yourself, or you can spend other people's money on other people. It's all only way that money can be spent. Now take way number one, your money spent on yourself. Now let's take... Cars is an example of something to spend on, and me is an example of someone doing the spending, okay? Now, 23 years ago, I bought a Porsche 911 uh, uh, that I love, that I still have. Uh, I, I got a great deal on it. I got, I got it almost new from a dentist who scared himself and bought a Lexus. Uh, and um, <laughs> now, see, when you spend your money on yourself, you get as nearly as you can exactly what you want, and you bargain as hard as you can for it. Now, way number two, your money spent on other people. Now, you still bargain hard, but you're not quite as concerned about getting exactly what's wanted, although I'm sure my wife is very fond of the geo tracker that I got for her and the kids. (laughs) Way number three, spending other people's money on yourself. Well, I'm on the fence between an Aston Martin DBS coupe that goes for $300,000 and a Maserati Gran Turismo convertible, which is a steal at $145,000. And in way number four, you're not involved at all. You're spending other people's money on other people. It's not your dime, and nothing is in it for you, so it might as well be billions spent on jack, or as the government called it, cash for clunkers. You, know? you see, and way number four is how all government spending is done. You know? Now, the expense of politics is bad, but it's not as bad as the brain of a politician. What brain, you say? <laughs> no, no. Alas, it is worse than a joke. Uh, Taken one by one, politicians are of dull, normal intelligence. Um, But when you put politicians together in government, you get committees. In Congress, they even come right out and call the committees committees. Now, everybody in this room has been on a committee, you know. We know what happens to intelligence and common sense when a person becomes a committee member. They get committee brain, you know. Now, you live in a neighborhood with a playground. Kids in the neighborhood would like to play tetherball, but the playground has no tetherball pole. So a committee is formed to raise funds for tetherball. Committee to raise funds for tetherball, CRFT. <laughs> now, CRFT is started by a group of pleasant, enthusiastic, public-spirited neighbors. The minute any of these neighbors becomes a member of CRFT, he or she will begin to express his or her pleasant, enthusiastic public spirit by turning into one of the following types. The stickler. We uh, have to drop a charter and form a nonprofit corporation with a chairman, a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, development officer, and human resources executive. And the tetherball pole has to be exactly four meters high in accordance with North American Amateur Tetherball Association rules. (laughs) Or the dog in the manger. We, we need to get permission from the county zoning board and, and, and city council, the parks department, and adjacent landowners who may complain about tetherball noise. That, that part of the playground is too damp for tetherball. It, it, it may be federally protected wetlands. Uh, we, we can't do any fundraising without advertising. We can't advertise without raising funds, and, and the kids would rather have a tennis court. You know? The person who is stupid even by committee brain standards uh, So the rope has, like, a ball on the end of it? (laughs) The worrier. Padded pole, breakaway tether, lightweight foam ball, uh, and and a ban on playing after dark or when visibility is poor, uh, and and when the sun is shining to avoid UV skin cancer damage. Uh, The kids should wear helmets and knee pads and safety belts. (laughs) The person with ideas. 
Let's set up a challenge grant to erect a second tetherball pole in the inner city. Midnight tetherball might be a, an alternative to crime for deprived youth. We could also promote tetherball as a way to combat childhood obesity, which would make us eligible for funding from the Gates Foundation. Uh, we'll have a tetherball league, no uh, three uh, adults, juniors, and tether tots. Uh, this could be a great Title IX thing. I mean, if our, our daughters are varsity level tetherball players, they'll, they'll get into Yale, you know? The person with ideas, none of which have anything to do with tetherball, is the tether biodegradable, is the pole made from recycled materials. Uh, many playground balls are manufactured in the third world countries using exploitative child labor. Uh, let's be sure to utilize organic fertilizer and in indigenous plant species when seeding the tetherball play area. The bossy person who says the same thing as everyone else on the committee, but louder. The person who, shut, who won't shut up, who says the same thing as everyone else on the committee, but more often. The person who won't show up unless he or his or her vote is crucial, in which case he or she shows up and votes the wrong way. And you, you, you actually do all the work. Uh, you, you call 40 people and you ask them each to donate $20 and half of them do and you raise $400 ne that, that you needed only to find out that you need $400,000. And because the House of Representatives Economic and Educational Opportunities Committees, Select Committee on Opportunities in Physical Education Subcommittee on Americans with Disabilities Act Compliance requires all tetherballs to be wheelchair accessible no matter how high the tetherball flies in the air. You know, given the complete dominance of politics by committee brain, the wonder is that anything gets done, and the horror is that it does. You know what I mean? What government accomplishes is what you'd expect from a committee. You know, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. That's a saying that couldn't be more wrong. A camel is a seeing eye dog designed by a committee and available free with government grants to people who can see perfectly well but who can't walk. <laughs> As an example of committee brain, I give you the Affordable Care Act, you know? Now I'll say this for President Obama. He has hit on a simple way to make health care cheaper. Uh, just make it worse. Uh, Government-controlled health care is going to drive the best people out of the business. I mean, who wants to spend a million years studying to be a doctor just to become a government bureaucratic hack? I mean, someday we're going to be wheeled in for open-heart surgery, and the surgeon's going to be the same guy who's now behind the counter when we register our car at the Department of Motor Vehicles, you know? I mean, if we're not careful, we're going to wind up with a health care system like they have in Canada, a nation that, that almost went broke from health care spending, even though Canada is a sparsely populated country with a shortage of gunshot wounds, drug addicts, and huge tort judgments. Um, <laughs> and what are Americans supposed to learn from a Canadian medical system that's devoted to hockey injuries and sinus infections from trying to pronounce, pronounce French vowels? You know, I, 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 well... What we'll learn, what we'll learn is to fix prices because that, that's all that Obamacare and Medicare and Medicaid, that's all they really are, is price fixing, you know, and price fixing works so well in North Korea, you know, and, and, and in New York City rent controlled apartments. Everybody knows how easy it is to find an inexpensive apartment in a nice neighborhood in New York, you know. Also, can we afford affordable care? I mean, it's going to be wildly expensive. Uh, free cat food breeds kittens, you know? And, and, and politically speaking, it's almost impossible to limit, let alone reverse, any entitlement program. I'll take an example that has been around forever, Social Security. There is no money in the Social Security Trust Fund, and there never was because money is a government IOU. The government can't create a trust fund by saving its own IOUs. I mean, any more than I was able to create a trust fund for myself by writing, I get a chunk of money when I turn 21 on a, on a piece of paper, you know? Social Security is just such a piece of paper, except it says I get a chunk of money when I turn 65, the government promises. Consult American Indians for a further discussion of government <laughs> promises. You know? I know politicians. I like politicians. I am friends with politicians from both sides of the aisle. Politicians are great. 
until they stick their nose into things they don't understand, which is most things. Then politicians turn into ratchet-jawed purveyors of monkey doodle and baked wind. They are piddlers upon merit, beggars at the doors of accomplishment, thieves of livelihood, envy-coddling tax lice applauding themselves for giving away other people's money. They are the lapdogs of the poli-sci class returning to the vomit of collectivism. They are pig herders tending that sow who eats her young in the welfare state. They are the muck-dwelling bottom feeders growing fat on the worries and disappointments of the electorate. They are the ditch carp in the great river of democracy. <laughs> and, and that's where one, that's, that, that, that's what one of their friends says. <laughs> but you know, the real problem isn't politicians. The problem is politics. Politicians are chefs, some good, some bad. Politics is boiled skunk. The problem isn't the cook, the problem is the food. Or let me restate that. The problem isn't the cook, the problem is the cookbook. Politics is the idea that all of society's ills can be cured politically. This is like a cookbook where the recipe for everything is to fry it. The fruit cocktail is fried, the soup is fried, the salad is fried, so is the ice cream and cake. Your Pinot Chardonnay is rolled in breadcrumbs and dunked in the deep fat fryer, you know? This is no way to cook up public policy, you know? Now, politicians lie to us. But you know, it's not as if they really have much choice. Because think, think what it would sound like on the campaign stump if a politician told the truth. Even an itty bitty bit of truth. Imagine a politician saying, no, I can't fix pu public education. I can't. The problem isn't funding or overcrowding or teachers unions or lack of computer and equipment in the classroom. The problem is your damn kids. <laughs> It'll be a very short career. You know? Now, my job is to make fun of politics. Uh, but, you know, I, after 43 years of making fun of politics, I've realized that I'm enjoying myself about as much as a grizzly bear getting a leg wax. I mean, I, 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 I hate politics. I really do. I just hate them. I, and I don't just hate bad politics. I hate all politics. I even lose my temper with the democracy you know, that, that we have to support. And, and, and let me note here that, 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 that so did Lord Acton. So did Lord Acton. He said, no despotism is more complete than that which is the aim of modern liberals. He said, prescient man. You know, what if our clothes were selected by the majority of shoppers, hmm? which would be teenage girls? Dick, Dick Cheney would have spent two terms as vice president with his midriff exposed, you know, I mean, as well. Imagine deciding what's for dinner by family secret ballot, you know? I've got three kids and three dogs in my family. We'd be serving Oreos and rotten meat, you know? Politics stink. I mean, think about how we use the word politics. I mean, are office politics ever a good thing? When somebody plays politics to get a promotion, does he or she deserve it? Well, when we call a coworker a real politician, is that a compliment, you know? Nonetheless, we are continually tempted to give more power to politics, you know? Power of any kind is dangerous, we know. That's why we're here. That's why this is called what it's called, you know? And political power is particularly dangerous. And politics is a Rottweiler ready to be unleashed on your problems, and you've stuffed raw meat in your pants pockets, you know? <laughs> Politicians work themselves into a lather, proving the benefits of government power. And using this politician logic, I, I, can prove, I can prove anything. I can prove that shooting convenience store clerks stimulates the economy. Huh? The jobs are created in the high-paying domestic manufacturing sector at gun and ammunition factories. Additional emergency medical technicians, security guards, health care providers, and morticians are hired. Uh, the unemployment rate is lowered as job seekers uh, fill new openings on, on, on convenience store night shifts. And money stolen from convenience store cash registers stimulates the economy where stimulus is most needed in low-income neighborhoods where the people who shoot convenience store clerks go to buy their crack. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, considering all the good it does, I am simply flabbergasted that everyone in the House and Senate isn't smoking crack and shooting convenience store clerks this very minute, you know? But I don't want to leave you uh, thinking that it's just our politicians who give in to the temptation to ask government to solve all of the world's problems, especially economic problems. We all, we all get confused about the role that politics should play in economics. We all forget Lord Acton's rule of politics and economics, which is every man is the best, the most responsible judge of his own advantage. Always remember that. But we don't. And the reason we get confused, the reason we forget, is because the political system and the economic system, they send contradictory messages. Economics sends us the message, I, I, I better not be poor. I, I better get rich. I had better make more money than other people. Well, politics sends us the message, some people make more money than other people. Some people are rich and other people are poor. We better close that income disparity gap. It's so unfair. Well, I'm here tonight to speak in favor of unfairness. As I said, I've got a 15-year-old daughter, and that is all I hear around the house. That's not fair. 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 That's very fair. And one day, I just snapped. I just snapped, and I said to her, you're cute. That's not fair. Your, your family's pretty well off. That's not fair. You were born in America. That's not fair. I said, honey, you had better get down on your knees and pray to God that things don't start getting fair for you. You know? You know? Tack with the income disparity gap. What we need is more income, you know, even if it means a bigger gap, because wealth is not a pizza where if I have too many slices, you have to eat the Domino's box, you know what I mean? Wealth is not a zero-sum game. In a moral political system with a free market, property rights, and rule of law, there are no losers when someone gets rich, you know? Politics promises equality. Everybody the same size, same weight, same income. Everybody with the same vacation. 300 million people headed for Disney World over the Thanksgiving holiday. Wait time for Space Mountain is now a thousand years. You know? <laughs> um, using politics to create economic fairness is a sin. It's a sin. The Bible is very clear about this. Now, that said... It's not that I agree with certain of my good friends uh, uh, about God being involved in politics. I, I, don't think, I don't think that. You see, my own attitude is observe politics in America. Observe politics around the world. Observe politics down through history. Does it look like God is involved? No, no that would be the other fellow who is the political <laughs> activist. You know? And in this opinion, I am glad to say I have Lord Acton's support. He said, in politics as in science, the church need not seek her own ends. She will obtain them if she encourages the pursuit of the ends of science, which are truth, and of the state, which are liberty. However, on one particular issue, I do get my politics straight from the Bible, specifically from the Tenth Commandment. Now, the first nine commandments, as we all know, nice to be talking to an audience where we all do know that. <laughs> it's not true on NPR. But <laughs> uh, the first nine commandments concern theological principles and social law. Thou shalt not make graven images, steal, kill, etc. Fair enough. But then there's the tenth commandment. Uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Now, here are God's basic rules about how we should live, a brief list of, of, of sacred obligations and solemn moral precepts. And right at the end of it is, don't envy your buddy's cow. Now, how'd that make the top ten? You know what I mean? Why, why would God, with just 10 things to tell Moses, choose as one of them jealousy about livestock, you know? And yet think about how important this commandment is to a community, to a nation, to a democracy, to an economic system. 
If you want a mule, if you want a pot roast, if you want a cleaning lady, don't whine about what the people across the street have. Go get your own, you know? <laughs> Tenth Commandment. Tenth Commandment sends a message to Congress, the White House, and to all of our politicians. It is a message about their promises for bailouts, for stimulus packages, for regulation, for redistribution, for subsidies, entitlement programs, tax borrow and spend policies. It's a message about all promises of fairness and about every other kind of what this institute's namesake called the splendid plausibility of error, the dazzling attractiveness of sin. And the message is clear and concise. The message is go to hell. Thank you all very much. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.